The darkness here was absolute, the musky smell only relative. Miklos felt a brief moment of panic when he realized that his bare feet no longer remembered the path to the stairs. He held himself still, his eyes straining to catch the least bit of the light he knew he wouldn't find. When it became intolerable to remain motionless, he edged his right foot out, sliding it with his hand extended at eye level, then slowly shifted his weight onto that foot. He repeated this action a few more times until his hand touched a wooden shelf and the bottles on it. This started to bring back memories. It was with a little more confidence that he sought the sandstone pillar that ran from the cellar up through the palace, helping to support the floors, ceilings, and ultimately the roof. When he found it, closer than he had thought, he used it to guide himself toward the stairway. As he left it, he was no longer holding a hand in front of himself. Instead, he brushed his hands together to remove the particles that still clung to them from the crumbling sandstone. By the time he had crossed the 50 paces to the base of the stairs, he was moving with confidence. Without the need to think of where he was going, he was able to concentrate more on what he would do. Up into the palace proper, certainly. Then where? Should he see Laszlo first or last? He heard the chittering under the stairs and smelt the clean, dirty, clean smell of a nest of Norska and was pleased that Vilmos still raised them. He was only a few feet from the stairs when he realized that there was another sound. He stopped and listened. Yes, there was someone before him. The sound of breathing was unmistakable. Moreover, he began to smell strong liquor over and above the scent from the wine casks. Who is there, he said. A voice he didn't recognize came back. That was to be my question, young sir. But, as you have managed to ask it first, I suppose I should answer. I am Mishka. And what are you doing here? Now, now, said Mishka. I've answered one question of yours, good fellow. It's only fair that you answer one of mine. Miklos stared into the darkness. Who could this be? A man sitting in the dark in the cellars of the palace? Should he reveal his name? Would the man recognize it? Have you light, he asked. More questions. I seek answers and receive only questions. Are you a god of Miklos laughed suddenly. Do you know I think I am? Yes, by the goddess, I have never thought of it before, but I have traveled far away to a place that you have never heard of and returned and returned. Yes, I think I am a god of He stopped feeling rather breathless, but Mishka's voice remained even. You are a strange god of then, if you can speak of the demon goddess. Miklo shrugged, then realized the other couldn't see him. After a moment, there was a scratching sound, a flare, and the room was lit. It took a moment for Miklos's straining eyes to adjust to the light. The Norska had stopped chittering. The one who had called himself Mishka was holding a torch in his right hand. Next to this hand was a long-necked ceramic bottle of some pale color. He was dressed all in black with bright silver buttons. His boots gleamed in the torchlight. On his head was a cap set at a rakish angle with a bright feather in it. He had a long, drooping mustache and thick black hair. He studied Miklos for a moment, then transferred the torch to his left hand. He picked up the bottle with his right and passed it to Miklos. The prince hesitated, not wanting a drink just then, but hoping to draw this strange creature out. He accepted the bottle and drank from it. It was Polinka, strong but good. You are dressed as a coachman, said Miklos, handing the bottle back. That's well, said Mishka. I am a coachman. You are dressed as a prince. Miklos smiled. Am I then? Good. Yes, I am Prince Miklos, as I'd thought. I am the coachman for His Excellency, the Count of Mordfall. There was perhaps a hint of irony in the way Mishka said His Excellency, but Mish Miklos didn't press it. What are you doing down here, Mishka, coachman to Mordfall? What am I doing, Miklos, Prince of Fenario? I am getting drunk. That is what I am doing. I suggest you do the same. No, said Miklos, I think not. As you wish. On impulse, Miklos sat down on the floor of the cellar. Mishka looked at him questioningly. Tell me a story, friend of Mishka, and I won't tell your master what you're doing. Mishka laughed loudly. Fair enough, my prince. We should explain, I think, that coachmen in Fenario spent their time in the stables with the grooms and stable hands, yet it was considered beneath their dignity to help with the work. 
So it was that they would help their comrades by telling them stories as they worked, thus relieving the tedium of the day. To this day, saying of a story, it is a coachman's tale, is the highest of praise. Well then, said Mishka, a brief tale only, I think, for the hour is late and I must be getting on with my journey to oblivion. Hmm. Yes, would you hear a tale of your own family, my prince? I will tell you a tale of the occupation. You know of it, I hope, how the northerners came into our land and only those of us in the mountains to the east escaped their yoke. Well, in that time, the king was trapped in his palace like a Norska in a Kriotha's net. They were then only beginning to build the tunnels in which we are now pleased to sit, my prince. But life went on as it would for many. Yet among the northerners was a young man who had a barbaric sounding name that I will not try to pronounce, who fell in love with a young woman of Fenario. She loved him too, I should add, but she loved jewels even more. So she begged this northerner to give her the biggest diamond he could find. The coachman took another drink of Polenka and offered the bottle to Miklos. The prince shook his head but didn't speak. Mishka continued. The northerner went to all the jewelers in the city, for as you know, the finest of the diamonds found in the western mountains are sent here, and he found one that he thought was good enough for her. He asked the jeweler for it. The jeweler handed it to him, but foolish man asked him to pay for it. Here's your payment, the northerner said. Up goes his sword and off comes the jeweler's head. Well, it so happened that one of the goddess's demons was walking around trying to make mischief for the barbarians. He sees this and tells the goddess. She sends a dream to the king's youngest son, since I'm told that's how she speaks to your family, and lets him know about it. Well, to leave off half the story, this young prince goes into his father's bedchamber and takes hold of Olam, the sword of the kingdom. And then he goes into the courtyard, finds a taltosh bull, and they leap right over the palace walls. So he goes riding through the northern army, who, after all, is going to get in the way of a taltosh bull, and comes into town. He finds this northerner all cozy in bed with the girl who's all cozy in bed with her diamond. He barges in, and before you can say, got a bunch us, runs him right through while she cries about how she'll never love another and all like that. There's much more, my prince. I could tell you of how he had to win back to the palace through the entire northern army after she betrayed him. I could tell you how all of them swept back and forth in all its battle madness, killing scores of barbarians at a blow. But that isn't the end of the story. The end of the story, Prince Miklos, is that when this young man returned to the palace, his father had found out that he had taken Alam, which only the king may wield, and so he had the sad duty of cutting off the young man's head. And that is the end of my story. Come to me when I am sober, and I'll tell you a longer one. Miklos studied the coachman, who sat back with an ironic expression on his face, drinking Polenkoff from the bottle. What happened to the girl, he asked, as he knew he was supposed to. The coachman smirked. She married the demon, he said. Miklos nodded his appreciation and watched Mishka for another moment. Then he asked, what exactly is the point, good coachman? Mishka snorted. Point? I don't know, my prince. Maybe within this story there is a prophecy of the tale of your own life. Maybe more. Maybe the point is the futility of all human endeavor. Maybe it is the triumph of justice, whatever the cost. The point? I don't know. You wanted to hear a story, so I told you a story. Ask yourself the point. If you are entertained, that is enough for me. In World War II, it was the United Auto Workers that built the planes, tanks, trucks, and jeeps that helped win the war. We had to do the job, and we did it. After the war, we rolled up our sleeves and built the American auto industry into the biggest in the world. Today, United Auto Workers build tractors and heavy equipment. We make the best and ship them everywhere because they're the best in the whole world. United Auto Workers and the aerospace industry built the space shuttle. And we still can make the best cars in the world. Sure, there have been problems. But now there's a new commitment by the car companies to design them right and engineer them right. And we're committed to building them right. Take it from me. We'll build them right. And that's what we want, to build the best cars in the world. That's good for the union, and it's even better for this country. A secure job is an important part of this. It strengthens our commitment to quality. And we can do it. You better believe we'll do it. We're the United Auto Workers, the UAW. Working hard, working proud, because we want to help make America work again. Well... Hi, this is another installment of Making the Magic, and um, today we are talking to uh, 
Stephen, Stephen Brust, Brust? Brust. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no and, problem. And I enjoyed your reading. Um, I guess the question that most people who aren't into writing would ask, where do you get your ideas? That, yeah, I think you're right. That's probably what most of them would ask. What do you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably a fair question no, for me, too. No, I don't want to. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the straight dope. What it is... It's is dope, every, huh? is no, that it? no, no. <laughs> is that what you're trying to say? Everyone has his own method. Mine is um, on the midnight of a full moon, I go out in back of my house and slaughter a virgin. I see. A with virgin? A virgin with black candles and the whole, the whole nine yards. And then I come back in the morning and her, her body is gone and there's this stack of crazy ideas. And it's just really neat. Now, unfortunately, we're running a little low on virgins, so I don't know what I'm going to be doing next month. Well, maybe they'll take goats instead. What do you think? Virgin goats? <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I'll try that. I'll try that. <laughs> uh -huh. why, do you write, why do you write fantasy other than the kicks you get when you get your ideas? That could be taken a number of ways. Uh, no. Why do I write fantasy? If I can, I don't know, I don't want to sound really pompous and pretentious, even though I am pompous and pretentious, but the things that I want to deal with and want to look at most are, I think, best dealt with in a fantasy context. Um, there's a whole number of, of questions that you can't that you can't really look at too closely. You can't look at your house from inside. You've got to go outside. You've got to go over to your neighbor's house in order to see what your house really looks like. Okay? And sometimes, if you don't have a neighbor, you've got to just go build your house and build a house for him to live in, and then you can look at yours. Is that too abstract, or do you see what I'm saying? Um, I think it's just a totally off-the-wall uh answer to <laughs> you ha I see that you have to build yes well no, I'm I very understand. sincere I well I, uh. I can feel <laughs> that you are I can okay what um you want an English okay. translation okay let me let me make it more specific um why do you write why do you write let's start with that I guess because I can't not write is really the only way I can answer that is that it's like an itch that you have to scratch, you know, where I say, oh, gee, oh, that, that's really neat. I could go play with that. Or, or um, here's this phrase that popped into my head, or this, this line that would just really be nice, and I've got to go get it down on paper. Mm -hmm. And they start coming after each other that way, and it just keeps going. Okay, then now I'll take this question a little further. Okay. Then you have to write, then why not write um, straight fiction or um, or w why fantasy why not I have never really thought of it as I am going to write fantasy now I've always thought of it as I've got this story and I sit there and I tell this story or more I've got this thing I want to look at I have this this question that I want to look at um, and so I, I will write this story, and it'll end up being fantasy. Well, what is the process of writing like for you? I mean, besides where you get your ideas, I mean, is it? Have you ever um, taken a needle about that long and poked it into your eye? Uh, um, not. It's, it's a lot like that. Not. Ah, I see. That's the way the process is. Is it something that you? I mean, like you were talking about, you get ideas, and does it? Does it come in a flood and it just comes out, or is it something you have to sit down like, like a person who punches a clock and saying, I've got to write now? Both. And, and sometimes, sometimes you'll sit there and it's sort of like there's a connection between the, the, uh, your fingertips and the back of your head, and it's just going And the words are just coming out there. And other times, you know, it's sort of like, what's your words per hour? Maybe five. And you sit there, oh, do I put that comma in? You know, what is the next word going to be? Oh, no. And the really annoying thing is that there can be whole sections produced very slowly and very painfully. And 
right back to back with sections that just wrote themselves and you can't tell the difference. I can't and other people. So you feel like maybe there's a block at times that's blocking that? Uh... No, uh, what I mean is that neither will read better. They're the same in terms of, of, how, of how good they are. I can't go any time I have to work at it, it's going to be better or it's going to be worse. You see what I mean? That's annoying. Mm -hmm. Was there anything like in your background, like educational-wise, that, that led you to, to writing? You know, how you, um, that process of, I mean, like some people would have uh, taken, maybe been journalism majors or English or something like that. Or well, I don't know. Um, I was captured and tortured by the Arabs from the age of five, and, uh, and uh, I was in a uh, Turkish slave. No, I'm sorry. Um, Slipping into fantasy. <laughs> uh, nothing I can think of. No. Oh, that's um, interesting. I, I really, I am aware that I'm not being terribly cooperative, and I apologize. Oh, that's it's um, a, more interesting, I suppose, in a way. Uh, I hear you're part of a, a member of a writer's group. Um, Tell right. us something about that. Um, the Interstate Writers Workshop, also known as the Scribblies. The Scribblies. Yes, uh. there are seven of us. We are all seven published writers. Um, we all seem to be doing science fiction, fantasy. Uh, and I can't speak for myself, but the other six are all very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you do? You get to get together and party, or do you have c some constructive critiques? Or we get together and we pass out manuscripts, exchange manuscripts for whatever we're working on, and get together and attack the person who wrote it ah, and, and praise like him. And also, we you know we found it's very important to say what you like as well as what you don't like, because if you don't point out, gee, I really like that passage, it's liable to vanish when the person rewrites it. So we, we point out what we like and what we don't like and sometimes argue about it and sometimes get into general, try to find general rules for how to improve writing. Do you end up sounding maybe a little less alike from this contact? No. You don't think so? I don't, no, I don't see how we could. It's, it's Certainly we don't, based on the books that are out, but I can't conceive of how we could. We're all... All seven of us are very strong personalities and not likely to um, not likely to blend with anyone else. Well, but, but you're still open enough to, um, to take this criticism and maybe alter your style because of it? I would say we would be likely to take something that doesn't work mm -hmm. and turn it into something that does work. Um, in other words, to take a passage that's purely that has grammatical errors and is obscure mm -hmm. and gives a, an effect that the author isn't looking for and it, turn it into a passage that doesn't have those problems. But there's a dozen different ways to accomplish any effect in writing. And that is a dozen ways that will work. And no two of us in the writer's group would pick the same one in any given case. So I, I don't want will Shetterly to sound like me, um, and neither of us want to sound like Pam Dean or Pat <laughs> Reedy. But on the other hand, we all want each other's stuff to be as effective as it can be for what it is. And we're doing different things. That well, sounds like a positive support group. I mean, I remember talking with Pat, I was, my thinking is that by being a writer you could get way too isolated. I mean, because hmm. the process is a lonely one, like being a, any, like being an artist, that you wouldn't, you might not have. Contact. Yeah, I suppose. I guess there's some, there's elements of that. Um, I, I have something of the feeling that if you really need a support group in order to write, you probably shouldn't be writing, or you probably really. Well, no, I don't know. mean to write, but I mean to maybe stay connected with the outside world. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Especially being fantasy. <laughs> You might escape a little too far. No into matter it. how much it's fantasy, what you're writing about is the real world because that's all we have. And the idea is to get closer to it. The idea is to write. If you're not writing about the real world, you're wasting your time. And I think it's especially true in fantasy. 
Boy, is that pompous. I say so, but it, it, he said it with such conviction that I oh, I mean it. I what can I say? All right. That's all that counts. <laughs> this has been another installment of Making the Magic, and we've been talking to Stephen Bruce. That's right. Got it. Goodbye.